Blessings in Jesus' mighty name. So I would say for months now, every night, um, demons attempt to torment me. How does that manifest? Basically what they do is they try to make themselves felt physically, spiritually, as much as possible for as long as possible. Um, I suppose you could call it like somebody sitting on you all night. That's what they call it. Sit on them. And it's obviously a hideous presence to us Christians because they're the opposite to the spirit that dwells in us. But for this reason, God allows them. God allows demons to torment saints for a number of reasons, to keep us humble. And it does keep us humble, but it's also a stark reminder that they're filthy pigs, intrusive, overbearing pigs. They just want to dominate others and intrude on them, rape them and kill them and beat them and viciously assault them. That's pretty much what they are. Actually, sometimes we have to remind ourselves that God flooded the earth because of them. That's why he flooded the earth, because their influence in the earth had led to a state of humanity where nobody had any good thoughts anymore, apart from the ones he saved on the ark. Noah and the seven. So everybody else was demonically influenced, satanically influenced, such that they no longer had a single good thought. So that's who they are. So they're the reason God flooded the earth. So the fact that they're still here and try to pluck our heartstrings is ridiculous. They're filthy pigs and they were renowned in the world because just of their size, of their capabilities, because their fathers were angels and they took human women as their wives and, and created the, the hybrid offspring and their spirits came from outer darkness. So the word dinosaur actually has been coined to describe them because what they do actually is they teach us lies about the physical reality but actually what they're representing is a spiritual reality to them. So I want you to think about this for a moment. The lies that have been told you about the physical realm that you live in are actually the demons trying to promote the spiritual realm they exist in. So I want you to think about that for a second. Demons are self-promoters. They love, sort of, are infatuated by, obsessed with their own image. And they seek mankind's attention because it gives them a kick that man would look to them and not their creator. They get sort of drunk, intoxicated by the idea. And they, they're very vicious and very dominating. Like I've seen it where the angel elect are with me because I'm a preacher of God. And a demon would very, very vehemently say, Mine? And they, when they speak, they actually sound like crows. Have you ever seen the movie The Crow? Well, demons are crows, like in the sense that they have sort of very sort of precise movements because they're not living entities. They're entities, but they're not living. So they're sort of robotic because they're spiritual. So the spirit is greater than the flesh. So the, cap the capabilities of a spirit entity are greater than the capabilities of one that exists within a flesh body. So when they do manifest in a flesh body, their movements can be quite robotic. There's a sort of a precision there that isn't natural to a human being. And their, their pitch, the voice they speak with is quite 
dry and flat line. It's sort of like a crow. You know, it's sort of like that sort of tone to it. So they're awfully strange entities. They're not awfully, but terribly strange. They're they're really they're hideous. And the closer you get to God, because as Christians we're we're moving away from the world. So we're returning to our Creator. And his spirit dwells within us. So now, because we're getting closer to God, Satan wants to get closer to us. And the whole point is to disturb us. Because when God wants to operate in us, the devil tries to constrict the spirit. So he tries to annoy and anger. So what he does is he calls spirits up from hell. They're the they're the whiplashes of hell, to the to the powers of hell, that he calls up from the from the underworld, to lash us with. So did you ever hear like oh, they'll whip you into shape? Because what they're doing is they're exposing you to something, to extract it from you. So God allows them to do this whipping process. Because spirit entities can see spirit. So if there's an impurity in your heart, they'll see it. They see what is theirs. They see it as theirs. And they're very uh, territorial entities, very possessive and territorial entities. So like if they've conquered a human being, they'll be like, mine, mine this kind of thing over them. Mine! And they're very sort of possessive like that. And their sound, like it's, there's a malevolent tone to their voice. So they're hideous. They really are hideous. Um, it's just, they are. Like this, like, the closer you get to God, the more they're like filth. Do you know when you have filth near or on you, if you want to get it off, it's like, Bleh. get it away from me. Yuck. And that's what demons are to us. And the cleaner we get, the more repugnant and repulsive they are. And any sort of affection or... It's like any advancement of somebody you don't want anywhere near you feels intrusive. Like... Even if it's just their nearby presence, you might actually leave that place if you didn't want them anywhere near you. But when a demon is in and around you, if God allows them to stay, there's nothing you can do to get rid of them. So demons are sort of calculating the cost of what they do. They're, they're sort of calculating it. They can't, but they sort of assess the risk and calculate the cost of how they go about oppressing the saints. And they know when something's starting to get costly. They know that. So, even though they won't know what that means necessarily in terms of the degree to which they'll be punished for what they've done. But they sort of get the idea when something is becoming more costly than usual or than other, you know, things. So there's all of that dynamic going on in hell. Hell sort of tries to count the cost of what it's doing. But ultimately hell is like a sunken ship that's going to sink more. Lots of ways you could look at it. But um, it's not good. Jesus said, hell shall be cast into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. It's really bad. Like hell is going to be completely destroyed by molten sulfur. Like it's just going to be eradicated beyond anything worth recognising. That's the reality. And so 
God allows us to be oppressed, but he, he does it for many different reasons, actually. He does it to cleanse us, um, to strengthen us, to improve us. He does it to draw us nearer to him, because by exposing us to what it is he hates, he knows we'll hate it too, and this will draw us nearer to him, because we won't want anything to do with that. You see, what a demon tries to do is basically submit you to its spirit by exposing you to it. That's all it has. Like the spirit of suicide only has the spirit of suicide to try and conquer you with. Isn't that hideous? The spirit of murder only has the spirit of murder to conquer you with. The spirit of violence and so forth, the spirit of addiction, you know, lust. All of these things are basically weapons of hell because they're the spirits of hell. You see now? So when they say, mine, over a human being, they're basically saying, I have conquered this one. Now, it's, they're not, te you're not technically theirs. That's that's inaccurate. You're God's. As a human being, you belong to Jesus. He created you. You're his creature. You're not you don't belong to a demon. You just are a slave to a demon. There's a different that's a difference. The demon won't be your judge. Jesus will. And the demon won't be advocating for you on the day of judgment. He'll have nothing to do with it. You'll be held accountable yourself by Jesus. The demon is just a dead crow already defeated. And his spirit is what he's trying to conquer you by. So that while you're here, he has access to your body. He's just a crow feathering his nest. The movie Body Snatchers is sort of along the lines of that. They're just spirits with no bodies looking for bodies. That's it. It's like Sesame Street. They want to enter into human beings to hunt other human beings. Because that's what they're here to do. It's basically lead to death those who would go and oppress and torment those who wouldn't. And that's our portion while we're here as soldiers of Christ. We won't draw back. You see, they tried to deter us. They tried to oppress us and torment us and just be a thorn in our side. And God allows that for, again, the reasons or the purposes of discipline, which is a lesson. He wants to teach us many different things. Um, the purposes of refinement, cleansing and strengthening. You see, to be cleansed, you have to be exposed to heat. And the heat we're exposed to is the very spirit that left a residue within us. You see, the spirit that was in us left its residue. But when Jesus came into us, he's the majority shareholder in my heart. And he won't share space with filth. So he he's actively allowing the demons to oppress his saints all over the earth for the purposes of the removal of those demonic residues. It's called preparation for the marriage supper of the Lamb. So God is allowing them to basically turn up the heat. They are the fiery trial. Your exposure to a demon is the fiery trial. And Satan is allowed to try you. And he implements his demons to do that. So the devil is just the worst entity that's ever existed. He's just a repugnant dragon. He's just a rotten belly full of dead men's bones. There's no good in that. And I would refer to him as a dat because he's a dragon. So there's no good in him. I hate him. Everything that he is. He's just a dead body, the skip of a sinking ship. He's just a murderous entity. No good there. 
just rotten and anything that follows him or serves him is the same eventually or now because it's either a demon or a fallen angel that's akin to him so hell has outward appearances of form but ultimately what it is is a lie Jesus said they have a form of godliness but denying its head so what the devil does is he uses, he uses men and he teaches them certain degrees of wisdom and those degrees of wisdom that he tries to teach men are only for the purposes of the facade that he uses to front his killing effort because if the devil appeared in front of you in his true form you'd run a mile so he hides behind men so the bible says that he's the spirit operating in the children of disobedience and he just has a whole load of petty low base tactics which when a saint of god with the holy spirit in us when we're actually exposed to it it has a pull it has a draw effect like a poultice and God allows that to be our cleansing it's a painful process like when you stick a poultice on an open wound it's painful and you really feel it so that draw and that pull that poultice effect is painful but it's necessary so that you can be refined in the fire as gold. That a beautiful thing. So God wants you to be so clean, even now, that when the devil does try to oppress you, he can't get a reaction. So that the Spirit of God is functioning in you in such a way that his light is clearly transmitting from you and radiating from you. So that the devil can't oppress you. And he comes, like I've had him do ridiculous things. Like when the Holy Spirit is operating through me and I'm preaching the gospel, the devil comes over, grabs my headset and throws it on the ground in some passerby. Like his tactics are ridiculously petty and scummy. But that's who he is. He is basically a bruiser, a thug, a common thief, a scumbag. There's no good in him. He's a tow rag. So he'll do anything he thinks he'll get away with to hinder the light of Christ in you. Anything. Anything. Really. He, he's just, there's nothing good in him. There's nothing out of bounds as far as he's concerned. He's a nobody. Just a murderer. So God allows us to be exposed to that evil so that we can be purified of the residues that remain as a result of having been exposed to this world in the first place. So it's, a, it's a really a cleansing process such as refining gold in a fire. So what happens in the process? Well, gold is melted by being exposed to heat, it's heated up and it's melted, reaches that melting point. And then the contaminants in the gold rise to the surface after having been heated, and then they're skimmed from the surface. Because you can't stick your hand into molten gold and pull out impurities. So you have to heat it to the point where they rise to the top so you can skim them. But then still some of those impurities remain. The heavier ones that would require a higher temperature to be brought to the surface. So that the fiery trial is incremental in that you'll be exposed to increasing degrees of spiritual oppression or torment or antagonization. Basically witchcraft tactics and the spirits of hell. So God will allow them to come at you, but not more than you can 
not more than you can bear. And the devil hates to be exposed. And remember, he's retaliatory because he's a beast. So he'll retaliate whenever he can have the opportunity to. And he's vengeful like that, you know. He's basically every undesirable trait that ever existed in one sort of person. And that's that's what it is. So God will allow that. The beautiful Jesus will allow you to be exposed to that for the cleansing uh, aspect of it. And it's painful. So be ready for it. But the Bible warns us, it says, Be not surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening. You see, testing is proving. Have you ever heard of the term proving? Tempering. You see, the test is the tempering. The tempering is the proving. It's all occurring at once. These are interchangeable terms to describe the same process. But they have different implications and overlapping ones, meaning the same thing. To prove somebody, prove so Jesus is proving his saints as his. Because we don't react to Satan's antagonization as those who would be sons of Satan would. We don't respond violently or with retaliatory action. This shows that we're Jesus's and not the devil's. So we're not undone by his trial. We're made firmer by it. We're cleansed by it. And this is what God intended. And the Bible says, what you meant for evil, I meant for good. See? So they're every low thing, every low and worthless thing. And that's what they are, the base elements. So any, any improper thing, and the most improper thing that one would think to do at any given moment is what they desire most to do. They are the antithesis of righteousness. They're the opposite of what you should be doing. And so they know exactly what not to do and exactly when not to do it. And that's what they'll do. You get it now? So that's what they are. They're the base elements of the world. So... The fiery trial is allowed by God to establish his saints as his soldiers. So we welcome it. And actually we, we, we rejoice in it and learn more to rejoice in it because it proves that we're Jesus's and we're getting to suffer with him. And this is more of a, more evidence that our names are written in the book of life even prior to the final judgment. So while we don't, like Paul said, I, I don't claim to have yet taken hold of it, we do have evidence that that's the case. Because the Bible says, uh, glory not that you have authority over all of the powers of hell. I do have authority over all the powers of hell. But, but when God is allowing me to be tested, my authority won't remove that test. Of course, the enemy would like you to lead you to frustration or doubt on account of that. So he's trying to lead you to doubt your authority or salvation on account of you ordering him to leave and he doesn't have to, you see. So he knows when he when God has allowed him to remain, but he's going to try and exploit every advantage, psychological advantage. So when... You're saying, demon, leave in Jesus' name, and the demon remains. They're going to try to exploit that psychologically to lead you to believe that because you weren't able to remove them, your salvation is in jeopardy or is in doubt because they're trying to lead you to doubt at any opportunity or to doubt your salvation, in other words, so that... God would not operate as strongly in you at that time. So they're trying to stay or push back the light of God or the will of God and strangulate it on account of leading you to doubt because God chooses to operate in the world through faith. 
So if they know that God operates in the world through faith, they're trying to stop God operating in the world. So what's their weapon against it? Doubt. So they fashioned all their weapons to try to encourage doubt within the body of Christ. So this happens on a psychological level. So that it happens by them op offering thoughts to your mind. And they try to bolster those thoughts with exposing you to a certain aspect or level of that spirit that would go along with that thought. <coughs> so that spiritual warfare, basically, because faith is your strongest weapon as a saint, faith, full, fervent, effectual prayer, terrifies them. But they won't let on that it's terrifying them. And so when they're most terrified, they pretend to be most secure because they're trying to mislead your reading of the situation. So they're just throwing everything at it. And they can lie because lies are theirs. They don't claim to be honest people. But they are tempered. There, there's a level of thing that they're allowed to do. And then there's a line that God has drawn. And it says it in 1 Corinthians. It says uh, that I will not let you be tested beyond what you can endure. I will offer you the way of escape so that you can bear it, in other words. So God won't allow you to be tested beyond what you're able to go through. So that means that Satan's, the degree to which Satan oppresses you is limited. And it's restrained by God. So don't worry about that. See, they want to lead you to worry. And they want you to misread your own expressions. And they do silly things. Like, they'll do silly things just to annoy you. Just to get a reaction out of you. Just to frazzle your circuits. Just to antagonize you. Just to upset you. Just to disturb you. Because they don't want you to be productive as a saint. They don't want you to be productive as a man of God. They don't want you focusing on what you should be doing. But rather they want you focusing on what they're doing to you. Do you see the point? Because they're terrified. They're pretty much terrified all the time. The Bible says... The demons believe and shudder. They tremble with fear. Because they know how powerful, uh, or they know, rather, that God is far more powerful than they can even imagine. And they're throwing their weight around in the earth. So they know, like, they're in, they're in, big dung like they're, they're up to here in it like. so whenever they're reminded of that they're terrified so our presence in the earth to them is a terrifying one because we remind them of the presence of Christ and they're reminded of what Jesus established, even though their best effort to destroy him was their course of action. He embarrassed them, shamed them, marched them naked and annihilated Satan's works, all in one act of sacrificial love by dying on the cross on the hill of Calvary. So they know that God did this through Jesus and they have no idea what he intends to do through us or when he intends to do it. So they, so like a cornered dog, they snap. A fearful dog becomes violent. They can't help it. That's their nature. So a demon is a fearful dog. They're vicious. They are vicious. And they react to fear with viciousness. But 
They're terrified. But they're terrified and stupidly stubborn at the same time. Like th their their actions and reactions are not an extension, a logical extension of their feelings. Like they don't react in a way that reflects how they feel. Not really. Like if you're fearful because of the ramifications of what you've just done, to then do something worse than what you previously did is obviously not a logical corollary of somebody trying to avoid harm or feeling fearful that the negative ramifications of what they've done have increased, therefore do something worse. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not logical. It's stupid. And that's the nature of the base element that is within them. It's base. It's, it's, it's not good. Like there's nothing good out of it. Nothing true, nothing orderly. It's just chaos. And so chaos has this accelerating effect, this spiraling effect. It just continues to do evil. It just continues to get worse. So they just do the most inappropriate thing they can think of compulsively. You see now? So they are literally rocket fuel to their own departure and rocket fuel to their own harm. The Bible says evil will consume itself. So the light is sort of their rocket fuel, but it's their reaction really to the light that is their rocket fuel. It's their departure from it that's their rocket fuel. So there's one way of looking at it and God establishes all things at once. He establishes all righteousness. That as the saints of God we're sort of escorting Satan and his demons off the property. That's one way of looking at it. We're sort of escorting them off the property. And all the way off the property they're throwing insults and stones at the soldiers, the peaceful soldiers escorting them off the property. Even though the peaceful soldiers have authority, they still throw insults and stones. And you can imagine, because they know that the peaceful soldiers aren't going to harm them any further right now. They're just escorting them. And so they're throwing insults and stones and anything they can at them to try and slow down the, the escort of the property. And that's basically what's happening. God has sent his saints and our reason, reasonable service is to expose the unfruitful works of darkness and this is their departure. So through all of this, the bringing of the gospel, the exposing of unfruitful works, Satan has to go away. But while he's being escorted off the property, he's increasing the harm within his own kingdom so it's like they're all accelerated in hurting each other as they depart. It's like dogs that have been chastised are much more likely to fight among themselves. See what I'm saying? So the Bible says that evil will consume itself. That's the nature of it. Satan is evil, the head of the evil kingdom, and he intends to do harm. And then once harm is done to people, they tend to want to do it as well. And once they've been conquered by the devil, he enters into them and changes them. And then they want to do what they see him doing. And so it has this um, franchising effect where anybody in the, in the kingdom of hell just wants to do what hell does. And that's hunt to man. So that it becomes this self-destructive kingdom, this body of death. The multitudes, the sea. It's a sea of death, a sea of souls departing from God. So we as the saints of God are the soldiers on the ground taking the abuse. Basically. And this is our reasonable service, it's our chastisement. It's God's chastising his sons who've returned.
basically. So that's what we get. <laughs> but it's ultimately for our good in eternity. So hallelujah. And we do get angry. Oh, we do get angry. I'll tell you we get angry. Because we take it for months. And, you know, every, everything has to come to a head, like, eventually. But what we learn is that our anger is quite tempered. And we get more tempered. Like, we get more in control. And we get our anger gets more purposeful. And then as we're going through it, we get more thoughtful and more controlled. And we reason better. So our anger is able to be... Just more controlled in every aspect, in all of its effects. Because when something happens, like when a stone drops in a piece of a pool of water, um, the ripples go in all directions. So when you're angry, it affects all parts of your person. So the ways in which it affects all parts of your person, you become better at controlling. And that's what God is doing. He's tempering us by exposing us to these spirits that would be antagonistic and provoke you and evoke certain things from you. So the devil, of course, is king protagonist. He's king antagonist. He's king wizard, the great enchanter, the dragon. So he's basically the one on the front of that operation trying to wind the saints up. And then he cracks the whip every now and again with some spiritual power that he, he wields. If you're not reacting like you did last time, he'll just up it a notch spiritually. So he'll use more spiritual voltage to sort of get the reaction again. And this is God allowing him to increase the test for the purposes of the removal of a contaminant that God would rather out of you for the preparation of this the marriage supper of the Lamb. So all of this is going on and it's it's amazing to watch God because we then, because of our anger, because we're incrementally increasing in patience and self-control, but because of our awareness of our own anger, we become more aware of how angry God must be. If we're wretched men and we're getting angry with this unrighteousness that we see around us, this, this immorality, how angry is God at it? And the Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. So if God is angry with the wicked every day, and we're only getting angry every so often, or every couple of weeks or every month, how accumulative must, how much anger must God have accumulated over tens of thousands of days? The wrath of God must be huge against the devil. It must be enormous. Because he's been hunting human beings ever since he fell for thousands of years. Can you imagine the anger that God has against him? It doesn't bear thinking about it. must be huge wrath imagine how much wrath a human being who fights against the cross of Christ accumulates and they only live 80 years he's been here thousands of years maybe seven six five six seven year, thousand years hunting men that like how much wrath must that entity be facing just doesn't bear thinking about but he will be tormented day and night for eternity he'd never escape Something we're thinking about. 
he'll be put he'll be thrown into hell and locked up and tormented day and night forever and so will you unless you come to Christ like God has been has shown us such huge mercy as saints like we can only be gra grateful but every now and again we do get a taste of God's anger because we have on the mind of Christ so we're looking at the situation as he would look at it to some extent and it's moving us to anger but we're also seeing how great our patience has increased how, how our tolerance of just stupid evil mindless evil has increased not that we would tolerate it or do it or embark upon it or have it close to us but that we could be exposed to levels of torment and degrees of um, trial that previously would have seen us you know extremely angry but Jesus actually commands us to be angry the Bible says be ye angry yet sin not and let not the sun go down on your anger and give no place no foothold to the devil because he will use your righteous indignation and try and twist it to just make you bitter and resentful he's just a twister he's a clown just throwing all sorts of different expressions and noises and dings and blings and bells and whistles to try and get these different and inappropriate reactions from you because he's trying to twist you it's called defilement but it won't happen to us because we're protected of the Holy Spirit Jesus said, no weapon formed against you, but it will be formed. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you shall confute. This is the inheritance of the saints. So I hope this has helped you if you're a Christian or if you're thinking about becoming a Christian. It's what you face, but it is worthwhile. Because God will cleanse you for the marriage supper of the Lamb. So come today unto Jesus. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Blessings in Jesus' name. A holy kiss.